Ladies and gentlemen, if I can just have your attention. Uh, thank you first and foremost uh, to the Minister for Finance, Mehmet Shimshek, and his wife, his staff, and of course each and every one of you for coming this morning, particularly on such short notice in a uh, busy t uh, town like DC. I'd like to now call upon the Minister, uh, Mehmet Shimshek, to provide some remarks as well as uh, to uh, give a presentation. Thereafter, there'll be an opportunity, if you'd like, to uh, ask a few questions. So if we can please welcome the Minister. Good morning. <coughs> I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. Um, I mean, Rumi platform is all about dialogue between cultures and civilizations. So uh, my presentation really doesn't fit. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, but you need money to do all that, you know, even to have a dialogue. So I, I guess, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I could independent of my presentation, we can talk about dialogue between different civilizations, but I guess you already know all this stuff, and there are people who are more experts at that. So I'd rather give you a sense of where Turkey is and where we had it. Um, uh, this presentation is a little bit technical for financial market people, but I'll simplify it. I don't have a remote sort of uh, control, so my advisor over there, she's going to help me. Uh, so uh, let's see how it's going to work. The biggest problem in Turkey right now is whether or not we're going to be able to manage some sort of soft landing. Now, what is soft landing? Soft landing is a combination of modest growth, decent growth, while addressing some of your uh, you know, deficiencies. And in this case, it's current account deficit. So can we narrow current account deficit while still managing to have a decent growth, a moderate growth that is still conducive of job creation. So that's the question. Um, if you look at post-global economic crisis, that chart tells you a little bit. Um, like everyone else, during the global financial crisis, we did have some downturn in our uh, GDP. But if we were to take pre-crisis GDP at 100, Turkey is now back over 111. Now, many um, developed countries, including the United States, they're not back to 100, to the extent that I know anyway, uh, in, in many sense, not only in GDP, but in terms of employment, etc. So Turkey is doing pretty well, actually, because in the run-up to the crisis, we had pretty strong fundamentals. And so the impact in Turkey wasn't really justified. Be simply, uh, you know, pessimism was contagious, and this was a byproduct of it. Um, well, optimism is also contagious because when everybody is, you know, running after higher returns, of course, you get bubbles. Um, in the case of Turkey, we had healthy banking sector, very strong fiscal position, and healthy household balance sheets, which is important for inner peace as well. Um, so we did have a, a good backdrop. Now, unfortunately, uh, in a world where everybody was trying to 
get out of the crisis through higher exports. And having good fundamentals meant that Turkey was you know, growing way too strong. In 2010, we had a real GDP growth rate of 9.2%. Uh, last year, we had 8.5%. That's great. So we're competing with Chinese. Uh, the problem is Chinese save a lot, and we don't. Because we live along Mediterranean Sea, and we, we are affected by that culture, so we want to spend our way out. And so there are obviously speed limits in this case. When you don't have savings that supports growth, you run into current account deficit, meaning you need other people's <coughs> savings. And that's exactly what we've done. So if you look at the first half of last year, for example, we had GDP growing at 15% year on year in real terms if you were to exclude the impact of net exports, meaning external dynamics. Well, that meant a very large current account deficit in the pipeline. In the second half of the year, we actually took measures and we tried to rebalance it because to sustain it, it needs to be, there has to be some sort of balance. And that's why we managed to moderate domestic demand and domestic growth while reversing the position of net exports from being a drag into a being sort of obviously a positive contributor. So uh, how did we do that? Well, we slowed down credit expansion. That's important because Turks, you know, if tapping into other people's savings means you have to go to bank and, and, and make use of resources from your bank. Uh, household leverage in Turkey is very low. In the United States, household debt to GDP is still probably over 90%, if I'm not mistaken. In the case of Turkey, it's still around 18, 19%. But the appetite in Turkey is huge. Everybody wants to buy new stuff. They want to move to a new house. You know, young population, various, so you, they have to be kept under some sort of control. So we need to, uh, essentially, we put our foot on the brake. Um, so industrial production is softening. Let's move on. Uh, current account deficit, as you can see, is that, does this say that my time is over? <laughs> it's too early, I, I've just started. <laughs> what does it say? <laughs> All right, okay. Current account deficit, as you can see, current account deficit as a percent of, uh, well, that's, that's in billion dollars, I assume, uh, from here, hard to see. But anyway, current account deficit is, is, is beginning to narrow from very high levels. That's a big headache for us. Uh, uh, we, had a, we had some adjustment in real exchange rate. I'm, I'm not going to go into technical stuff, so let's move on. Um, the question is, can we manage a 4%, which is our target for this year, real GDP growth, which is half of what, is, what it was last year, at a time when you've got Eurozone, you know, in, in obviously big trouble, when you have Arab Spring, that doesn't help, and when you have large current account deficit that we're trying to narrow. Yes, we think it's doable because in the last four years, I mean, during the global economic crisis, United States destroyed about five million jobs. Europe, entire Europe, or let's say Eurozone, destroyed almost 2.8 million jobs. We created on our own, on a net basis, 3.5 million jobs. So that means we still have a fair bit of momentum, <coughs> plenty of jobs created, and that means we have got a long way to go. Um, unemployment, this chart tells you a little bit. This is seasonally adjusted. Um, you know, you start with 100, where did we end up and where we are right now? Europe, obviously you can see, uh, they started with 100 and they continued to edge up. They haven't stopped edging up, meaning unemployment rate continues to rise. In the case of Turkey, we are at a decade low, and still high in absolute terms. But you know, in Europe, it's easy to lower unemployment rate because they don't have, working age population is actually falling. It's not growing. But in the case of Turkey, working age population is growing by a million a year. <laughs> so if we don't create jobs for 800,000, a million people, our unemployment rate would go up. So what we've done is phenomenal. I mean, you have to take that within that context. So old age population, I mean, you know, in Europe, 
uh, I mean, aging population and, and, and in the case of Turkey, very young demographics makes our job a lot more complicated. But even with that, Europe has not been able to do anything. Um, real sector confidence is still very strong. Turks tend to be very optimistic. Uh, two thirds of them are happy with their life. Let's carry on. Uh, composite indicator, I'm not going to go into, again, technical jargon. Uh, bottom line is people are optimistic, so we're going to have 4% GDP growth. Well, the banks, banking sector. Um, by the way, during the global economic crisis, none of our banks failed. None of our banks needed help. We did not have to increase reserve, you know, deposit guarantees or anything, simply because Four years before the crisis, we were doing stress testing. Five years before the crisis, we were asking banks to have more capital per unit of risk they were taking, meaning all the things that the rest of the world began talking about in 2009, 2010, we were actually doing in 2006, in 2004. Are we smarter than people? No, it's just simply we are more, more prudent, let's say, because we were burned so badly in 2000, 2001, that we had to do something about it. Back in 2000, 2001, that was before my government in being in the office, um, Turkey hit the wall, and Turkey was actually on the brink. Essentially, Turkey was bankrupt, I mean, in, in, in real terms. And with the help of printing money and, and getting some assistance from IMF, they were able to carry on. Um, because I can tell you one single number, and that would be enough, in 2002, when we took the office, when my government took the office, if Turkey was collecting 100 liras of tax, interest payments on government debt was 86 lira. So you can imagine. Anyway, so the banks, uh, we, you know, we had a banking sector crisis in 2000, 2001. We cleaned up banking sector. We liquidated, you know, some 20, 22 banks. And we jailed the owners who led to the bankruptcy. And uh, we introduced some <clears throat> draconian laws. We said, if the bank fails because of your own mistakes, you as, as shareholders, as management, and your entire family are personally responsible and liable for the losses. I mean, I'm not joking. And so we didn't have to do any sort of fix to bonuses because <laughs> didn't have to do that. Um, and it worked. Anyway, let's move on. Um, banks have been growing, by the way. They've been increasing their loan books, you know, by, I don't know, 11 times, 14 times, uh, while still asset quality has improved because problematic loans have come down dramatically. And right now, it's pretty reasonable, meaning every 100 loan, only 2.7% of that goes bad. Um, banks have been profitable. If you look at from 2007 to 2011, if they, had, if they had 100 lira of equity, meaning capital, they made 20 lira profit every single year on average. So think about it. While the rest of the world were experiencing massive bankruptcies, Turkish banks were making more money than ever before by any standards, meaning 20 lira for 100 of investment is, you know, or capital that is committed, it's amazing. And uh, that continues on. So, um, and by the way, to get out of this cri global crisis, we didn't print money. The Europeans um, have printed one and a half trillion euros. They have to, you know, to help. And that's how they actually contained the Eurozone crisis. It wasn't the politicians doing anything magical. It was European Central Bank essentially dumping money, printing money, giving it to the banks for three years and say, you know, we'll, we'll buy you time, then you can fix it. And in the case of Fed, it's even worse. The balance sheet has tripled, meaning you are printing dollars after, as if there is no tomorrow. Um, and, you know, in the long run, who knows what's going to happen. But for now, you know, it's may be helping at the margin. In the case of Turkey, this is Turkey, the Turkish Central Bank, they've been really stingy. They haven't printed any money uh, because we didn't need to, uh, to, to get out of this mess. Uh, Turkey, fiscal discipline. You see, this is the core problem. 
Um, typically, if you have deficits, then you have debt, and if you have debt, then you have problems. And in the case of Turkey, yes, we had a lot of deficit and debt in 1990s, we fixed it. But let's first look at the pre-crisis and post-crisis situation in some advanced markets. If you look at OECD countries, and that includes 34 countries, and that includes countries like Turkey, the average debt to GDP ratio rose by about 30 percentage points, from about 70% to over 100%. US from around 60% to over 100%. So as you can see, there has been an implosion in debt to GDP ratios. Um, in the case of Turkey, we're keeping deficit low, but more importantly, we're keeping debt low. Our debt to GDP ratio is about 39.4%. That is gross debt to GDP, by the way. If you look at our debt net of the money in our pocket, meaning you know, the deposits we have with the banking sector and the reserves we have, is actually 22%. So we are in very good shape. Turkey has never been in such a strong position in terms of debt profile. Um, and we really mean business because when we took the office, uh, deficits were running at 12% of GDP. And 10 years prior to us, or nine years prior to us, on average deficits were about 8%. We've reduced, on average, the deficit to about 8%, but last year we actually had a, a tiny, tiny deficit, uh, and we could have had a surplus, but I decided to be very generous to the Transportation Minister for Infrastructure and education, things like that. So, um, so debt to GDP ratio was close to 80% in Turkey. We actually managed to bring it down. And we're hoping to bring it down to 30% on a gross basis, 30, 32%. Uh, and if you look at government's net external debt, in lira terms, it's now actually down to a level that is getting closer to zero. So net external debt position has improved dramatically from where we were. Um, just to give you some color, how things were in Turkey. If you go back to 80s, these were reasonably decent years, but still, um, Turkish domestic debt stock in nominal terms gone up by over 60 times. But what was happening in 1990s was more dramatic, and debt had gone up by almost 800 times, meaning 770 something. Uh, in the case of AK Party time, it's gone up just in line with inflation, one and a half times. So essentially, we are, when it comes to debt and deficit, we really try to keep our house in order because we know what it means to be borrowing and then you know, running into difficulties. So, uh, and that's how, if you go back to 80s, Turkey didn't have much debt, so interest payments were making up about 13 to 15% of, let's say, tax revenues. At the peak, it was close to 100. When we took the office, 86% of taxes were going to interest payments. So how would you do any public services? Any, any you know, how, how would you pay salaries and things like that? Well, right now we are back to 17%. That's quite a dramatic adjustment. And now we have got almost 84 lira out of 100 lira tax we collect, and we give it to poor, we give it for infrastructure, we give it for education, we give it to healthcare. You see, there is some connection to Rumi, I assume, here. Uh, so we must be sort of subject here. Uh, yeah. So we've got, we've got problems. We're not perfect, nowhere near perfect. In fact, we have lots of structural problems, real problems that we need to address. The biggest one is competitiveness, which gets itself reflected in current account deficit. And there we go. We've got short-term, long-term, and, and medium-term measures to fix it. And from a very short-term perspective, of course, there's not much you can do. Uh, we, we're slowing down domestic demand. Uh, we let the currency adjust. So we let you know adjustment mechanism take place, which, which is working. Secondly, we need to improve the quality or improve some inflows to finance it while we are working on medium long term. And uh, right now, you know, they've, they've got lots of rich people in Gulf nations, in GCC countries, meaning uh, Qatar, you know, Kuwait, etc. They want to buy houses in Turkey, we say, no, we can't sell it to you. Why? Because you don't sell it to our citizens. Uh, same with Kazakhstan, same with Azerbaijan, all these people making all this money out of oil, 
they want to buy houses in Turkey property, and we say no way, because you don't let our citizens to do it. We decided it doesn't make sense from our perspective, so we're changing this reciprocity rule. We're going to let them buy it. Uh, secondly, we're really working on improving investment climate to get more of you. Well, I don't know whether you know you are into investments, but it doesn't matter. More of Americans and others, rest of the world, to come and invest in Turkey. And we must be doing something right. Uh, you know, when we took the office, there were only five thousand, you know, roughly five six thousand international companies operating in Turkey. So in eighty years, we attracted in eighty years of Turkish Republic, we attracted about five thousand. 6,000 foreign companies. Now, in just nine years, we attracted an extra 25,000 of them. So actually, we must be doing something right, so companies do have confidence. Um, yeah, and uh, if you go back to 80s, that's when really FDI picked up in, in globally to emerging markets. Uh, all the way from 80s to, to the point when we took the office, FDI inflows were about $15 billion. In just nine years, we attracted $110 billion. So that, again, gives you some sense of you know, uh, how, how things have been. Um, OK, medium term, what are we doing in medium term? So short term, we're trying to attract money because we have no other choice, grow more moderately. You know, There's a saying in Turkish, um, uh, Albert, maybe you could help in, in a fight. You know. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, it, in Turkish it says you have you cannot extend your legs beyond your blanket, otherwise you get cold <laughs> or you get sick. So uh, unfortunately, we don't do right now. So we need to. Anyway, we've just introduced a new investment incentive scheme. Bottom line is, we say, look, if you want to invest, um, uh, basically no taxes for the next 10 years, whether it's income tax, whether it's corporate tax, whether it's social security premiums, whether do you want a land, we give you it for free. Do you want, uh, or do you need capital? You don't have money, we'll give you a little bit of interest subsidy. You want to bring machinery and equipment you, you know, to the country, no customs tax, no VAT. No, VAT is value added tax, meaning sales tax. So bottom line is, if you just want to, I mean, I would be really puzzled if somebody had their money in their pocket and had a little bit of idea and wouldn't invest in Turkey. But, uh, you know, who knows? We'll see. We just introduced it two weeks ago. And uh, we think uh, through this. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a general scheme. Uh, but we, don't, we only give this money to sectors where we think would help fix our current account deficit. So we identified something called strategic sectors, sectors where import, um, you know, is, makes up 50 percent of domestic consumption, and you know the company can create 40 percent local value added. Technical stuff. Bottom line is, we're going to give a lot of incentives for kind of import substitution model, not exactly because it's more transparent, more competitive, but it's kind of anyway. Uh, Let's move on. Uh, R&D, research and development. Let's move on. Uh, uh, basically, we have a problem. In terms of value chain, we are unfortunately not at higher up levels, meaning the high and medium tech makes up one third of our production and exports. Low and mid, middle, mid, uh, so yeah, low and yeah, medium low makes up uh, about two-thirds of our exports and production. But we need to move up the value chain to dislocate Europeans. We don't want to compete with low-wage Asians. And so that's a big issue. And to do, to do that, we need to get R&D spending by companies and by government. And exactly that's what we're doing, if you move on. Um, R&D spending as a percent of GDP is almost doubled. It's very low. We want to uh, triple it by 2023. By 2015, we want to double it again. Let's move on. Per capita R&D has tripled, but it's not enough. We want to increase it more. Let's move on a bit faster. Uh, so we're producing more, obviously, uh, scientific publications. It's tripled. It's gone up by three times in nine years. And we're moving in global ranking, but we're nowhere near where we would like to be. 
international patent applications and registrations have gone up by basically uh, three to five times uh, in just nine years. So there is a revolution that is happening, is underway. It will help us. Let's move on. Uh, in terms of trademark applications, a few years ago, Turks, you know, brand name, commanding higher profit margin, it wasn't really on their sort of radar screen. And so we created this awareness. We're giving them money to actually focus on this. And now they have become number one in Europe in terms of <laughs> trademark applications. And, that's, and we are actually beginning to build up our brand value. According to International Brand Office, Turkey increased the value of its brand by almost 20% uh, in 2010. And I'm sure in 2011 it's continued to go up. And, uh, in terms of industrial design applications, these are important stuff for future. Um, we are only number three, number you know, a third in Europe after Germany and France now. So really, we're going very fast. Um, energy is a big headache for us. We import. You see, we are in a neighborhood. Everybody is rich. Energy have got rich energy resources, and we are extremely poor. We pay fifty-four billion dollars to import energy. Russians, if you exclude energy taxes, Russians actually have a budget deficit of $200 billion. So, you know, you can compare. I mean, Russians, if you exclude budget, uh, sorry, it's simply revenues from energy to the budget, uh, Russia could go bankrupt in a few years. I'm, uh, it's not on the record, yeah? No, I'm just, uh, seriously, I mean, you know, X, X uh, oil revenues, Russian budget, is, same applies across the board in the entire region, whether you're talking about Iran, whether you're talking about Gulf, you know, Middle East, North Africa. Usually, most countries, 90% of their exports or 60% of their exports, 90% of their budget revenues come from some sort of oil and gas. And in the case of Turkey, absolutely none. Exactly the opposite. We paid last year $54 billion to energy imports. Now, higher energy oil prices don't help. If you go back to, by the way, 2002, when we took the office at the end of 2002, our energy bill was only $9 billion. And unfortunately, now we pay, probably this year, we're going to pay more than $60 billion. So that's a big headache. So what do we do here? Well, we're trying as fast as we can to diversify away from hydrocarbons and from uh, basically imported, obviously, fossil fuels. Right now, if you look at our energy mix, 65% is import-based. Most of it is natural gas-fired plants. But if you look at the next five to 10 years, we're building 40,000 megawatts. We have 53,000 megawatts right now. And of that 40,000 megawatt, 20,000 that is completely renewable, meaning wind energy and hydropower plants. <coughs> the rest, the other 20, is going to be mainly local coal Lignite. Of course, we're looking at nuclears because clearly uh, you cannot rely on wind and rain. So you have to have something more sort of solid to support. Plus, of course, solar, when and if it becomes practical and affordable, Turkey has kind of sort of a, a solar map that is not far from sub Sahara. I mean, or Sahara. I'm not joking. In, in certain parts of Turkey, that's exactly what you get. If you go to Urfa, which is known as the um, city where uh, Prophet Abraham was, was born, um, if you open your door during summer, like in June to whatever, September, it's like 45 degrees and you don't want to get out of your car. Um, anyway, uh, a few years ago, we were number 35 in terms of wind energy in Europe. We're now moved to number 10. We want to be in the top three in the next five years. Now, I know it's very ambitious, but we think we can do it because we have everything in place and we're now getting investors just to build the capacity. Um, yes, we're also trying to get people to save more. We just announced something like, you know, the US model. If you put aside 100 lira, we'll give you 25 lira, but you cannot touch it until a certain period of time. So we're giving 25% support uh, for anybody who wants to save money. 
Plus, we're now going to support venture capital, you know, business angels, and all this kind of stuff. So all the fancy stuff, I'm not going to go into detail, so let's move on. Um, long term, well, these were medium term stuff. Long term, of course, human capital stock matters. The quality of it even matters more. And so we start with education. Um, Turkey, unfortunately, in the past, didn't allocate enough resources for education. We are now changing that dramatically. Um, if you look at the resources from the budget, in just nine years, we have increased it by five times. And most likely, this will continue to double, even at these levels. Why? We have 18 million students, which is bigger than population of almost, with the exception of a few European countries, almost everyone in Europe. Just students. We've got 18 million students. We've got extremely young population, and so we are channeling the resources into education. The number one uh, sort of recipient of resources from the budget used to be defense budget. And of course, uh, it was no use. And now it's, it's education. Defense is now kind of like, you know, lower than healthcare, lower than, uh, you know, social security, lower than many others. So in that sense, it's now number six. It's no longer number one. And so priorities have changed. Our priority is now people, and we're spending money on their education. And that's why the average schooling rate has gone up. Uh, we're going to have to increase it even further. Let's move on. I mean, uh, in the past, also, we had a problem. Um, in the past, in the southeast part of Turkey and eastern Turkey, uh, which is culturally conservative parts of Turkey, they were not sending their daughters to school after primary school. And we said, this is not acceptable, because in Islam, education is compulsory not only for men, but also for women. So why this discrimination? So Prime Minister's wife, Amina Hanım, she took an initiative, along with UNESCO and many others, like Daddy, Please Send Me to School type sort of programs. Essentially what we did, we said, we told mothers, we said, if you send your daughter to school, we'll give you a monthly salary. That's as simple as that. Small <laughs> one. So we literally were bribing uh, mothers to send their daughters to school. And it worked. It really worked. We had 91 uh, students, uh, girls, per 100 boys in schools. And now we have got exactly, you know, actually more girls per, per boys, because some of them are catching up. So this is this has really worked. I'm not joking. I mean, it's big. Deal. And recently, we decided to extend the compulsory education period to 12 years. That was a big debate about it. The opposition thinks that you know we have a completely different hidden agenda. Of course, for the past 10 years, we had hidden agenda. For some reason, never comes out. You know, it's always hidden. Um, you know, we want to change the country in a way that is regressive. Uh, that's obviously not true. But anyway, uh, the reason why we increased the compulsory education to 12 years is because if you look at Turkish population above the age of 25, well, the average years of schooling for entire Turkish population is six and a half years. Now, there is a saying in Turkish, um, uh, Albert is not going to help me, of course he refuses. So, uh, <laughs> It says, Türkler ortaokul tek, meaning ortaokul is like, uh, you know, after primary school, you've got middle not school. high school, but middle school. So we haven't even completed middle school as a population. So we want to change that. So we're making now finishing high school compulsory, meaning everybody has to finish high school. So what is the trick? The trick is we don't want to do it sort of continuous 12 years to allow for other type of schooling, meaning technical schooling or other, you know, needs, even including religious education, Quran and stuff like that. We're saying you've got preschool schooling of two years, and then four years, and then another four years, and then another four years. Actually, we're increasing it to 14 years, but anyway, the, the two years of preschooling is not compulsory. So bottom line is, it's very important that we do the education in the long run, and we really want to put more money, and we are putting more money. Education is number one priority for us, and we'll continue to spend. By the way, if you're a student in Turkey, you get free lunches, 
you get free supplementary milk now, you get free transportation to school, um, and if you're really poor, we give money to your mother, not to the father, because father would smoke, uh, mother, and to help the kid go to school. So this is, we are, I mean, our education budget, even excluding what we pay to teachers and, and to pay for building schools, we actually really supporting students. And same applies to university students and PhD. If you're a PhD student, your annual fee may be 1,000 lira, but we give you a monthly, we give you over 700 lira, just a scholarship, you know, or a loan by the government. So essentially, if you want to do PhD, if you want to do master's, if you want to do undergraduate, we're giving a lot of support to students. Either if you're rich in the form of loans, if you're poor, pure scholarship, that would cover your entire school fee and beyond it to facilitate living in Turkey. And this is only the case for the past nine years. It was really low levels in the past. I'm not an expert, but we brought the experts together. And their conclusion was that teachers need to be retrained. But of course, we've got 720,000 teachers. How can we train these people? Um, so we decided that maybe there's a better way. We decided to equip every single school with fiber optic infrastructure, which has happened, with an interactive board, you know, white, big white board, like touch screen, smart. iPad style smart board. Plus, uh, everybody will get an iPad type tablet, you know. And so we will produce content centrally from Ankara and Istanbul by the best teachers. And any students, even in Tokat, that's where Albert and, and Ken spent some time in the 60s. Uh, even in a village in Tokat, through satellite or through broadband connection, they will be able to download the lecture. So regardless of how poor or how good their teacher is, they'll be able to have access to best lectures that is possible out there. So we're trying to use technology to really sort of catch up. And we just started that, delivered the first bunch of you know, uh, tablet pieces, and we're trying to get somebody to produce it in Turkey, by the way. We have more, in the, let's say, interventionist industrial policy. Now, after the crisis, of course, everything has changed, and we are changing as well. We no longer believe in market efficiency. Okay, um, infrastructure. Let's move on. If you go back to Turkey, in 2002, and this is in particular for, for anybody who visited Turkey back in I don't know, 1990s, they'll probably remember. This is the map of multi-lane roads in Turkey, meaning either highways, like motorways in UK, or just dual carriage highways, meaning multiple lane roads. This was the map in 2002. So 80 years, 57 governments has done the first map. The second map is nine years, AK Party governments, and that is the map. That is the map of so we have done more than two times what 57 governments had did, done in 80 years in terms of road infrastructure. How did we do that? Yesterday I was asked and I said, it's magical, I'm not gonna share it. No. <laughs> okay, so railways. So it's not only roads, we're also building railways. During the early Republic era, Turkey was building 118 kilometers of rail per year. I mean, small, but still. But between 50s and 2003, they were building only 11 kilometers. Now we are building 135 kilometers per year while rehabilitating 200 kilometers or more. Anyway, so if we move on, we're now one of the very few countries in Europe to have high-speed rail, meaning up to 300 kilometers, up to 250 kilometers speed. Uh, and uh, some of them are complete, some of them are under construction, and we are planning to connect Europe with China, hopefully one day, through high-speed <coughs> rail networks. So, uh, you know, if you wanna choose to travel by train. Istanbul, uh, by the way, Istanbul has routine population of 14 million people. It's bigger than 20 EU member states. So Istanbul is bigger than 20 EU member states. So we are just investing in Istanbul, but Istanbul, you know, is tough 
you dig anywhere and you come up with 8,000 years of history and, and you know, it puts, you know, all the projects. But this project is a big one. We're building all sorts of metros, but also we're connecting two continents with a railway. Uh, and, and that's really uh, an important. Let's move on. Uh, THY is now number three in Europe in terms of passenger. And everybody is able to fly in Turkey. Only privileged people used to fly in Turkey, meaning rich people. Now all the villagers are on board. They're going from one place to another. Let's, let's move on. Um, of course, I just give you a story, and maybe you're amazed. But of course, I told you we've got problems, we've got structural issues, but we also have risks. One of the biggest risks is high and rising oil prices. That is to do with not only Chinese demand, but also is to do recently, at least, with geopolitical risks, meaning Iran. Uh, of course, eurozone is a, in a big uh, debt crisis. If you look at empirical studies. Uh, it says that when debt to GDP ratio exceeds 90%, usually potential growth goes down. And in Europe, for many countries, that's exactly the case. And so we have huge exposure to Europe, which means European problems are actually Turkish problems. And we cannot diversify away fast enough from Europe in economic terms, I'm just joking. Um, meaning, we used to, Europe used to account for 58% of our trade volume, uh, for our exports. Now it accounts for 40 plus, you know, 42, 43%. So we've diversified away a lot, but still Europe is the key destination. Uh, and of course, China has been growing very fast. There are some fears that it might have some sort of hard landing at some point, even though it doesn't link, look credible in the short term. So bottom line is there are some risks. So how did we achieve all this? Well, first of all, we have reduced corruption. Now, you may be surprised, but that's really the case. And I'm not saying it. Uh, International Corruption Perception Index is not a Turkish index. It is from UK, and they cover almost all countries. If you go back to 2002, among 102 countries, we ranked uh, 65th, meaning we were 37th most corrupt country among, you know, the sample uh, of the 102. <coughs> now they're looking at 183 countries. We rank number 61, so we're still corrupt, but not as corrupt, <laughs> and less corrupt than many other countries. Now you may think that all the newcomers, meaning the sample expanded and all the new corrupted countries popped in. No, 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 that's not the case. Like, look at Italy. What was, it, what was Italy? If you could read it to us. 31. 31. Where is it now? 59. See? So it's not, um, please don't quote me on this. I mean, I hope this <laughs> recording is only for local, for in-house consumption. What I'm trying to say is that many, many, many countries that were ahead of us in 2002 in terms of cleanness, transparency. <coughs> we have now really, in terms of our standards, we've got. So I wish I had the whole sample because, I mean, some of the countries that were ahead of us in 2002, if it was really awkward to even mention the names. And now Turkey has really imp is improving. So we're going to improve more. Second, we are pro-business. It's as simple as that because we know that to create jobs, to create value, to export for investment, you have to support business. And so we support business. We tax people, but we support business. It's very simple. And ease of doing business is another uh, World Bank uh, index. Uh, again, among 150 plus countries in 2006, we were not doing that well. 93. 93. OK, today, among 183 countries, we are 71. OK, so we're still improving but nowhere near we would like to be. We want to be in the top 10, ideally, and hopefully maybe one day in the top, sorry, initially 20 and then top 10, because we're really ambitious and we want to achieve that. In, in, in like a few years, we've gone there. If you look at competitiveness index, that's World Economic Forum. Again, uh, unfortunately, among uh, 125 countries, we rank just over 70. Uh, in 2005, we now among 142 countries, we rank 59. So again, we're not where we would like to be. We need to continue to improve, but we're working on it. So as you can see, 
We've got lots of challenges from improving quality of education, from improving ease of doing business, from uh, becoming increasingly even less corrupt to many other uh, issues. And all of these to do with macro performance and well-being of people. If we can do all of that, and I'm sure people would you know, uh, probably uh, have a better understanding of the world because they'll be able to travel, interact, meet other people. You see, more Turks are now going abroad. Some of them, they go to Paris for a drink. Some of them, they go to Mecca for pilgrimage. But more of them are going because they've got a richer and they interact with more people and there is better dialogue. And what can, you know, I mean, obviously, clearly, that's the purpose. Uh, so uh, there is more work to be done. I'm happy to answer any of your questions uh, you know, uh, that you might have after this long and lengthy presentation. Thanks for bearing with me. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We've got one hand here straight away. Yes? Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, you, you said that uh, Turkish government put in jail people who were responsible for banking crisis. What's your take on Wall Street and all its corrupt businesses and the fact that U.S. government in fact bailed out uh, corrupt businesses and corrupt banks? And uh, also my second question would be, well, what do you think about the quantity of easing that Ben Bernanke is implementing in the United States? And do you think that depreciation of dollar would uh, somewhat affect negatively Turkish exports versus Chinese who pack Grameen B against dollar? Sort of still have it. They're Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, every government bails out, sadly, you know, you're having to bail out banks because you have no choice because you have masses who deposited money, and you really, as a politician, you just simply have no choice. And Turks did the same thing, Americans are doing the same, Germans did the same thing, British did the same, Kazakhstan did the same, you know, UAE did the same, so everyone. The problem is, um, you know, whether or not the, uh, the, 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 the uh, let's say, the CEOs or, or, or executive committee gets away with it. In the case of Turkey, that's no longer the case. In the case of the United States, I'll leave it to you. I mean, uh, whether that's the case or not. So the point I'm saying is this. When you have millions of people who deposit money, trusting the government and the policies and the bank, and put the money there, uh, sadly, very few governments can resist to that masses. So you end up bailing them out. So taxpayers end it, ends up paying. And that's what Turks did in, in 2001, um, you know, 22 banks collapsed, we liquidated, we spent a, a quarter of our GDP on essentially paying for this, and we're still paying for it. But we said no more. So th that's the difference. So I won't comment on, on the rest. On your second question, uh, of course, printing money, I mean, in orthodox textbooks, clearly leads to what you just said, ultimately currency weakness at some point. Uh, or inflation at some point, even when there is demand. Uh, but we're going to, through some uncharted territory, meaning the world is completely upside down. All the textbook, you know, uh, orthodox textbooks, conventional theories and stuff like that, they're all being debated. Uh, as, you know, myself as an economist, you know, I'm, I'm, bottom line is, um, you know, what Fed is doing, you know, may serve well, if you could get a little bit of confidence, you know, if you could improve the level of consumer confidence, business sentiment, instead of hoarding all this cash, I'm not talking about consumers in the United States, I'm talking about companies, if they could begin to channel some of that cash into investments and employment and exports, and with a bit of help, obviously from weaker dollar, why not, you know, strategy could work. And after all, you're lucky because everybody's willing to hold, you know, dollars. Um, and Chinese are happy to continue to build up their position here. So in the long run, there are all sorts of question marks. For now, I guess that seems like QE3, not sure whether it's going to happen or not. Markets were betting on it. They were disappointed last week that it didn't happen. And they're still betting on it. And uh, so who knows? It depends on the labor market. Labor market 
continues to improve on a sustained basis, meaning if you can create jobs, then probably you don't need QE3, but you really, instead of, I mean, printing money on its own hasn't worked, it's not working on its own. You need to do something more, and uh, that's where, again, you know, confidence about future, you know, credibility comes in. So bottom line is, uh, uh, currency weakness could help in the short run, um, but ultimately, really, what really helps is structural reforms. Uh, U.S. traditionally has been a competitive market, uh, a, a country that supported uh, supports innovation, competition, and therefore a more productive society. Uh, last few years, you've got problems. Part is political. Partly it's uh, fiscal, which is also political, uh, and uh, you know uh, it, it depends. Uh, you know, really, the strength of the political uh, situation. I mean, like in the case of Turkey, you couldn't have done a quarter of what I've just said had it not been for a strong government in Turkey. If we didn't have the the the, the backing of people, the army would have toppled us probably. <coughs> I mean, as you can see from all these plots that are coming out, a long time ago, meaning, because they were never, you know, uh, but we, we changed the country. We had the mandate, and we used that mandate pretty well. And, and we've created jobs, you know, GDP in Turkey, in, 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 in 1990, Turkey's GDP was $200 billion. In 2000, it was $200 billion. So we had gone nowhere. In 2002, Turkey's GDP was $230 billion. Today, Turkey's GDP is close to $800 billion. So within nine years, we have more than tripled our GDP and per capita GDP. Uh, why, how, how did we do that? Again, I'm going back to the basics, political stability, and, and, and good politics and good policies. And I think US has great talents and, and you've got Amazing is just you need to save more like us. We're not saving. We should be saving. We, you know, we should be saving more, and you need to basically again go back to basics. Yeah. I'll take one one last question. We'll no, no, no. Uh, Albert, uh, okay. can, uh, as a bonus, you, your name in uh, your uh, organization, John George Mason University. I, I'm a big fan of Turkey's economic accomplishments. In fact, I wrote a paper saying Turkey's fundamentals were better than those of Russia or China, and that we should speak of the Timbis with Turkey and India and Brazil and not the BRICS. But the next stage of growth, as you say, depends on your investments in education and innovation. And That's for right. those to pay off, it's not just a matter of investment <coughs> in research. You need an atmosphere of intellectual freedom to grow ideas. Exactly. And the plots that you mention and the prosecutions are having a negative effect on intellectual freedom. My question is, I mean no disrespect, but when can this government start to put the concern about plots and conspiracies behind it and create this open, pluralist, intellectual ferment that you need for the next stage of growth? Thank you. I think that's a very relevant question. Um, you know, we have been, uh, I mean, a lot is happening, by the way. And, you know, what you see and what what is real sometimes, you know, perception, reality, but also on the ground. The, the, the problem is we have a, a judicial system that is not fast enough. And in that sense, unfortunately, there is a process of victimization as well uh, of those who actually may not necessarily be so clean. Uh, but we really try to get judicial system to move on and fast enough and be fair. Because we're not after, it's not about vendetta. It's not about revenge. You know, whatever has happened has happened. We need to move on. We need to build the country. And I completely agree with you. And sometimes Turkey gets reflected in the press in a very different way. I mean, just to give you some color, if you read Press Freedom, for example, you will probably get stories like so many reporters in jail, like 66 or 90 or 108. The reality is, if you actually decompose that data, those who really members of press won't be more than two or three and they were released, uh, there was a plot whether they were part of it, 
The others were actually people caught bombing on behalf of PKK or literally, you know, armed whatever attacks and things like that. So it's, it's not, yes, they might be uh, part of a small uh, outlet in a small town uh, and, and they might be considered, spread, but if you get involved, whether you're a member of press, whether you're a professor, whether you're a politician, it doesn't matter who you are, if you do something wrong, if you do something illegal, you get prosecuted. Nobody should have immunity. And that's exactly what is happening, but it gets reflected in a completely different way. So yes, a judicial system that is fast enough and fair would certainly serve us, and that's exactly where we would like to get. Plus, I agree with you. I mean, um, you know, there, there is a correlation between the strength of your democracy, the strength of freedoms, you know, the, the, the fundamental rights and freedoms, and the, strength, the, the, the level of creativity, the level of, obviously, innovation. I, I, I would be the first to, to, to see that. And, and, you know, when you look at across the board, I think that's, the, that's what is the difference between different countries. And so we're there. We think along the same, but unfortunately getting there and all these change is, is not easy and it takes time and, uh, you know, we're just hoping for, uh, for the best. Yeah. Where are Albert? <coughs> you can ask in Turkish if you want. Thank you very much. You've been very good. That's a good question. You know, when I took the office, um, uh, I said, can you find out, I told my staff, you know, we have IRS type, you know, we call it revenue administration. So I asked the president of revenue administration, I said, can you please just go and look at your database and find out how many of people who own more than four flats, and how many of them actually reports rental income? And he came back and he said, well, you know, um, uh, hundreds of thousands have never ever knocked on our doors, meaning they never ever reported. So I said, let's start with those who have more than four flats, and then we can move down. This year, for the first time as minister, I went on a YouTube, okay, a video. And as I warned the households, the younger and everybody, I said, if you don't, will come after you because now we get all the data from insurance companies, from banks, from these registry and stuff like that. So we get everything. And by the way, we, we hired the most famous comedian and, and you know, we said, can you do something for us? Like we prepared, uh, normally in this country, for you to file your tax, you have to get a form, you have to take it to your accountant or be an expert, you do it yourself, yeah? In the case of Turkey, we said, no way, no need for that. Give us a call, we'll come in and do it for you. But if you are in internet, internet literate, meaning if you have internet at home, we prepared your form, just have a look at it online, and if it is yours, and if it's correct, just say okay. If it's not, correct it. Mm. We did this, and suddenly, and we sent uh, people letters, and we sent them SMS messages, and we sent them emails. So like, everybody got something. And the, the message says this, look, we know that you make income, we know that you have this flat and this flat and this flat, and we know that you don't live in all of them. And by the way, if you don't come, we'll come and audit you, and we'll charge you for five years backward interest and also penalties and all this kind of stuff. Suddenly, in just one quarter, meaning year, we increased our taxpayers by 300, 40,000. So it's being proactive. I mean, people, of course, uh, tax are just laws, but you have to implement it forcefully. You cannot just expect people to give away their money. Uh, well, the best one is the United States. Uh, we're not there, uh, but I'm, I'm, we're really working hard now to broaden the tax base and to make the tax system fairer. For example, right now, I mean, Istanbul is an expensive place. If you go to one of those luxurious uh, high-rises, a square meter could be, I don't know a square feet, but a square meter could be as high as, let's say, $10,000, $20,000 in luxurious developments. But there is a law in Turkey, it's funny, um, and I'm changing it this week, 
it says um, if your flat is less than 150 meters VAT rate meaning the sales tax is 1% and the usual rate is 18% so you get 17% back so you buy let's just say a hundred square meter flat in luxurious Istanbul place for a million dollars yeah and you get $170,000 kickback from government. Strange, because they did it in the past based on square meters. So I'm saying, what well, doesn't make sense anymore. You know, maybe in a village, 250 square meter flat is $50,000, but a 50 square, square meters of flat in Istanbul is million dollar. So I'm gonna charge it based on the value. And so we're changing the system across the board. Uh, a gallon of gasoline, how much is it in here? Four dollars? Five. Well, five if it's in the city center. Yeah, it's four. In Washington, it's five. But if you go to countryside, normal place, four dollars. Guess how much it is in Turkey? Over twelve dollars. Mm, it was, but it's now ten dollars fifty cents. Just one gallon of gasoline. Ten dollars fifty cents. We tax, uh, I said it yesterday on a panel at the IMF, I said we're like Robin Hood style, you know. Those who have cars, those who have, you know, obviously like in Turkey who can afford it, you know, the middle class or high income, we tax them to subsidize education, subsidize healthcare. Healthcare in Turkey, everybody is covered. Whether you work, whether you ever worked or not, everybody has a health care insurance by the government. And you have access to free uh, private hospitals and state hospitals, no difference. And we spent on average per population on health care $700. US spends about seven, eight thousand dollars And I can tell you, our health care system is probably no less in terms of service, in terms of coverage, in terms of access than here. So it's just different ways of doing things. Um, we really have done a, a revolution in healthcare. And, and so all of these requires taxes, income, and that's why we're going after people. Um, if you buy a Ferrari in Turkey, probably tax rate is no less than 300%. Uh, I don't know the exact, but it depends on the size of engine, but probably, I'm just giving you some color. Even if you buy a standard sedan that is more than 2,000 cc, the tax rate is 130%. So we tax consumption, but we support business. So that's the difference. Uh, that's, that's how we're trying to do things. Okay, uh, thank you.